This is the Patreon jingle, asking you to join our Patreon so you can get some bonus content and also because I'm still unemployed and it would be nice to do high knife full time. Some patrons get bonus episodes while others get bonus art. But all patrons get early access three days ahead of the public. Now that I've got you in the mood, let's listen to this horror Horror podcast. Listening to Heine by Motsi Dapu, Episode Thirty Eight Sinungaling. You okay? Yeah, I'm fine. We can do this another time. No, no. I asked. And you got Ashton and Murphy's statements. So, you should get mine. Since... Since you went off on your own without backup? (laughs) Yeah, since that. Since when are you the one making stupid decisions, Donner? My mentor was attacked. It was time-sensitive. Then why didn't you call me? I tried. There was something just wrong with the communications. Seems like Laura got to you just fine, though. (sighs) I'm billing you for my write-up. Seriously, though. I'm glad you're okay. Thanks to you. Mm Mm-hmm. Hmm. Well, to me, all that matters is that you survived. But, like you said, we need to have a record of everything that went on tonight. Did you find what you were looking for? No. But I did find something. Worth the trouble of tonight, if nothing else. Given that you almost died? Agree to disagree. But, okay. Tell me what happened. Okay. When I arrived at the necropolis, I didn't run into anyone guarding the entrances. I was able to walk right in. Could have just been right place, right time, of course. But I want to take note of that, just in case it wasn't a coincidence. When I got to the William Grave, I didn't see anything particularly unusual. Just an untouched grave, much older than some of the others, built into the hill. I knew where to find it, though, because I've heard of it before. From from stories a cousin once told me about the necropolis from when she was younger. You might have heard the story. She called into that DJ in the dark show about it once. Actually, quite recently, too. Yeah, you remember. I expected to see something similar to what she did. A strange wall. A monster. (laughs) A black cat. Young boys. But, But I saw... Absolutely nothing. Hey there, little one. Oh, ho, ho. it's okay. I think you met my cousin before. 
You saved her life, remember? Hmm. Pocket, right? Oh, that's right. Come here, little one. I don't know what you are, but I know you mean well. You saved my cousin Rosario. She got you tattooed and everything. But you scared her too. It's okay. I've seen far worse. You can show me, you know. <laughs> okay, alright. You don't have to. Yeah, I see it. I know you don't want me to go in, but... I have to find something that was left here. Maybe hidden? Maybe lost. Do you know where that might be? <laughs> the man with the red hand. Richard Henry. He might be after it. He might come for it tonight. And I have to get to it first. Do you understand? Thank you. Do you know what's in there? I know it's dangerous. I know. But if I take you away, what's left to stop whatever's in there from getting out? So it's November. Mari gave me the tape she recorded, and I got to listen to the stories she found in Elaine's notes, including Jay's secret entries. After that night, I told Laura where to find the book of elders. The grave in Mount Pleasant, under Elaine O'Donnell's name, held Clifford Bolden's corpse. But she herself was secretly cremated. Her ashes were spread to her favorite places in Toronto, and her fans knew to visit the memorial under her pseudonym. The memorial is actually where she hid the book, somewhere no elder would have ever thought to look. The grave of a moderately successful erotic romance novelist. It's nice to know she got to live such a happy life, even after all the tragedy she experienced. It's kind of funny. Her focus ended up being her favorite romance novel, Delicious Indignities. It's, uh, bad, but I couldn't stop reading it. Like, I'm not interested in romance or sex. And there's a lot of sex, but it's weirdly intriguing. Also, it's funny. I don't know. You got a lot going on. Makes me glad Elaine found something she loved this much. And her life wasn't just defined by horror and tragedy. Also, I'm glad I got to do some light reading before diving into this book of elders. It should be safe, given what Jay and Elaine said about it, but still, it feels dangerous to have all this knowledge at my fingertips. I already skimmed it to see if I recognized any names. CJ's in here, Vanessa and Giuliano Bartolotti. 
Grigori, who I'm told was the elder that took the form of the axe-wielding Reznikov back when I was ghost hunting at U of T. And the benefactor. I might record these entries soon. I don't know if that'll do anything supernatural, but Jay made this book to be safe, so probably not. Either way, I'm going to ask Mari before I try anything like that. She and Laura came to see me while I was in the hospital. I got checked for a concussion and thankfully got the all clear. Better off than the boss, Ashvin, I mean. At least, he already wears the eye-collar shirts. Felt awful. He was trying to protect me, even while Clifford Bolding was hurting him. I can't help but think that if he didn't have to worry about me, maybe he wouldn't have to. To carry Bolden's mark. Oh! Is that the sound of unearned guilt and self-blame I hear? Well, it's getting around. Uh, um, oh, um. Kidding. I didn't actually hear what you were saying, but you sounded real sad while you were saying it, so... Doing some light reading? I haven't gone too far into it yet. I want to ask if you could check it over for, you know... I'm pretty sure it's safe, but... Gotcha. Give it here. Hmm. Nothing. No bad feelings, no scent of death or suffering, but, like, the absence of a scent, you know? Not like the warmth of a good focus or a loved object. May I ask what you were planning to do with it? Oh, well, I thought that maybe we could record the entries on tapes, like Jay's notes, just in case. It's our only copy, after all, and maybe we can share them with each other this way. It's not a bad idea. But would you mind if I did it? Oh, um, sure, but why? Ashvin just put an idea in my head. And I feel that I would be safer if I did it. And, maybe, if you stopped getting involved in all this. Mari. Evelyn. I made a promise. I'm... I'm the only one who talked to Elaine O'Donnell directly. I'm already in it. I've been in it since you saved me from Reznikov. I mean, Grigori. Even if you tried to get rid of me, I'd still be working at Ashvin's store. I'd still ask about the cases. I I'd still get involved in whatever way I could. So... All right, all right. You don't gotta twist my arm, Ne. Ne? Ne, ne. Banga. Gamai. Bulile. Hey! Don't just call me names and not tell me what they mean. They mean that you are a baby. A little itty-bitty baby. Aren't you, like, younger than everyone else on the team? Touché. But I graduated college at 19. I've been part of the adult workforce for a ripe eight years. I'm old by youth standards and deeply, deeply traumatized. That's why I look so wise and elderly. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Uh, there is actually a reason I came to see you. Other than to make sure you are doing okay, which you seem to be. As okay as any of us can be. I'm glad you're okay, too. <laughs> like you said, Kayapa. I, um, I wanted to check the book. 
if it covers all the elders Jacob study, does it have Richard Henry? Yeah, it does. Um, why? He was the one who went after Donner's mentor, and he's the reason Donner's in a bad way. But there are things that aren't adding up, and I need to learn everything I can about him. Of course. Um... Hmm? Would you mind reading it out loud? If you can? Oh, sure. Of course. Richard Henry, known to other elders as the Right Hand, or the Red Hand. He was originally William Savard's assistant and Right Hand, before he eventually became the Benefactors. By all accounts, he looked and dressed like an ordinary man. He wore ordinary clothing, often favoring high-collared pressed shirts, buttoned up in all aspects. A stolid professional, from his role as manager in one of Savard's many factory offices, to his eventual rise in status upon joining the Ordo. His powers were varied. He learned the spells that his fellows developed, both within Savard's inner circle and without. His own specialty was a signature red hand, which was a spectral hand that could extend far beyond himself, perform tasks with such dexterity that, according to some reports, he was able to play impossible three-handed pieces on the piano, a talent that he had long possessed. By many accounts, he was powerful, skilled, and capable. Yet few knew his mind, for he was an accomplished stoic, often disappearing into the background, seemingly more interested in fulfilling the desires of his betters than pursuing his own goals. Or so it seemed, even to those who knew him best. He was the first of the elders to realize that Savard had disappeared, and relayed the news to the inner circle, before it broke to the rest of the Ordo. Unlike those who vied for power, Richard Henry seemed more interested in filling the role of right hand once again, this time to one of his own equals, the mysterious benefactor, whom he began to represent in dealings with other factions. Richard Henry had a face so ordinary that many identified him by other things, his high collars and his fine cufflinks, which were never absent from his wardrobe when he came to visit. In some instances, there might have been attempts to shoot the messenger, as it were, when Richard Henry laid out the benefactor's terms. But he was protected. He chose well in cleaving himself to the benefactor, whose protection spells were the strongest among the elders, apart from Mary Ann's. It is unclear if he would have sought Mary Ann to assist, had she not passed away from mysterious circumstances prior to Savard's disappearance. Richard Henry is perhaps the most dangerous of the elders, apart from the benefactor himself, because nobody knows his mind. Nobody knows his goals. Perhaps not even the benefactor himself. suppose you know a safer way down. Unbelievable. Is there a limit to what you can do? (coughs) 
I followed a narrow tunnel from the entry point at the William Grave. Not sure how long it took, but it felt like 20, 30 minutes. <laughs> My phone gave no answers. Signal was dead. And the clock didn't move the entire time I was there. It opened up, eventually, and I was met with this gigantic pit, <laughs> with this round staircase leading all the way down to the bottom. It wasn't pitch black, thankfully. There were these old factory work lights caged into the wall from a bygone era that somehow were still running, lighting my way down. Huh. From up high? I could make out a pattern in the tiles, but I couldn't identify what it was. All I could see was a dark circle lined with symbols. It took me a while to get down, taking the circular steps. It was like the gargantua, that enormous man-made pit that might have once been a waterway, now bone dry, closed off. I knew it was dangerous, but I needed to look to find out what was left there that would push an elder to attack my friend. When I got to the bottom, I tried to get pictures of the symbols, but they came out so corrupt, so I drew them instead. Huh, don't look at me like that. I know the danger, but I wasn't sure if they'd be there later. Huh, I'm not even sure if we can find our way back there now. Maybe you and Laura will have a chance to check it out while I'm stuck here for the next few days. Thank God they brought my coat. Here. I don't recognize them, but maybe CJ will. Or <sighs> Vanessa. You said she took a look at the Gargantua for you. I was supposed to touch base with her about her findings today, but, well... Ugh, fine. I mean, if I asked to be discharged early... I would knock you out myself for much longer than these very legal drugs. Ominous. You gonna arrest me, officer? I mean, if you don't let me wake up... Wait. Don't... Don't joke about that. Not after... <laughs> right. Right. Sorry. So, what happened after you took those notes? There were paths going out from there. Tunnels? I... I uh, picked one. Picked one at random. And just kept walking. They weren't lit like the pit was, so I just used my phone to light the way. I don't suppose you can tell me what I'm about to find at the end of this tunnel. Hmm. How long has it been since someone gave you good pets? Since Rosario? Or have you made friends since then? Oh. What's that smell? thing that went after Rosario? At least, the remains of its original form. <sighs> Looks like it's been here for decades. But, ugh, why does it still smell so uh, rot? found in the Gargantua, except without that giant head. Old machinery that looked esoteric, occult. 
markings on the wall that looked similar to the ones at the bottom of the pit. But the symbols didn't quite correspond. And just like the one in the Gargantua, there was a body in the middle of it. Except this one wasn't that of a little girl, but a full-grown man. Huh. Apart from the fact that he was missing his head. What struck me most while I was there, the smell. Because it was old, decades old. But there was this smell, the smell of a body that was just a few days old. The smell of decay, of rot. Not dissimilar to the smell of the rotting thing we fought when we first met. If you remember the story my cousin told, Rosario, when she called into the DJ in the Dark Show, she talked about a man without a head. It's a much more dangerous thing that the other monster was trying to warn her about. Turns out, the ghost was a pretty literal translation of the body that was in the pit. A man's skeleton in fine clothes, covered in bloodstains, missing a head. Couldn't take a photo, or even attempt a drawing before I had to run. But I do remember the details. The clothes? Older, but not by much. A few decades, maybe? 70s, 80s, a fine suit, not too different from the ones I saw growing up, but with a high collar, stained brown with old blood. And on one or both of his hands, I could only see one, he was wearing these fine, expensive-looking cufflinks. The sparkle caught my eye, bright against the brown blood, right before I had to make a run for it, with the bleeding, decay, headless thing hot on my heels. I could hear it. Smell it. But thankfully, I could outrun it. Well, at least for a while. Unfortunately, it was only after I found the stairs that I realized I needed to go back. Destroy whatever was keeping this headless ghost kicking just like the rest. Without backup. So I went back. Thankfully, whatever was interfering with my phone signal wasn't interfering with my firearm. Every time that headless thing tried to make a grab for me, I could slow it down with a shot. It wasn't exactly easy to get back. As soon as it sensed my presence, it turned me around gave me new paths, distorted the space around me, just like other foci and other remnants of the dead elders, which was what I suspected this man to be. But it seemed weaker than usual. The illusions? They were always just a little bit off just convincing enough to trick someone who might have been panicking. But I had to force myself to stay calm. And I have a good memory. And it helped that the awful smell was the strongest in that control room. So, even if I was going in blind, my nose would have told me exactly where to go. Look, I don't want to bore you with the details, but... It took me a while, and an extra clip to get back. The old blood was wet again, boiling around the fine-suited skeleton. But I remembered what happened with the rotting thing and the buttons. And while I don't have your sense for the supernatural, well, I took one of those bony hands and I shot one of those cufflinks point-blank. It was like the world screamed around me. And I knew I had it right. I just had to destroy the other one. But now that I was wise to its game, it was desperate. One of those bony hands grabbed my side and squeezed hard, 
puncturing the skin right beneath my ribs. I was lucky it didn't go deep enough to hit organs, but God, the pain. Still, I grabbed the other hand. My hands were shaking, but the way it struggled, I missed my last shot, my last bullet. But still, I was able to knock it loose. It hit the floor, disappearing into boiling blood, hot to the touch when I scrambled to grab it. But I couldn't think about that, nor the pain on my side. I felt it before I saw it, and without thought, I brought the butt of my gun down on it as hard as I could. Another scream all around me, and then nothing. Silence. A bony corpse and nothing else. The worst was over, but... Well, I still have to climb back up. Even without magic, I was deep, deep underground. So my phone didn't have any signal to call for help with. So? I climbed. It's okay. I shouldn't expect you to fix every single problem. If it wasn't for you... The fact that you've kept him locked up for so long... Destroying him must have taken a lot out of you. Even with my help. As little as I could give. <coughs> Almost there. You found it. You really are quite the accomplished detective. Pocket, run! Quiet now. I must thank you, by the way. You played your part perfectly. I never could get past the wards on this place. I tried leading your old friend here, but he could never find the entrance. But you, well, you walked right in. With all the trouble you and your little friends have caused, Michael, this really is a pleasant change. And now... What? What are you doing here? Wait! No! The next thing I remember, I'm in the back of an ambulance, and... You're looking at me like I died. So you don't remember anything else? You just passed out right before you came to the entrance? <laughs> yeah. Why? When I found you... Never mind. Is there something you want to tell me? <laughs> I don't know, Donner. Is there something you want to tell me? <laughs> I'm just... I'm just glad you came. To save you. <laughs> to visit. <laughs> it's always good to see you, Mari. <laughs> I'll, um... Uh, I'll leave you to rest a little longer. This tape has my talk with Ashvin, and a debrief with Murphy, and Evelyn, too. Give him a listen, after you get some sleep. Okay? <laughs> okay, okay, all right. <laughs> See you around, detective. See you around.
Daughter, daughter, wake up. Hello? Please, we need an ambulance. We're at the, uh, the Toronto Necropolis. You're listening to Hainai by Motsi Dapul. Hi everyone, it's Motsi. Last time, I talked about how the World Central Kitchen, or WCK, sent food on a ship run by Spanish aid group Open Arms from Cyprus to provide relief in Gaza. Since that time, seven aid workers from WCK were killed by Israeli forces, targeted and bombed three times over despite prior communication with Israeli forces. This is not the first time this has happened. Israeli forces also killed the child, Hind Rajab, and two Red Crescent workers, Zeno and Ahmad Al-Madun, who went to rescue her, despite prior coordination with Israeli forces. They also killed many members of MSF, or Doctors Without Borders, as well as their family members. This atrocity has caused major aid sources to pull out from Gaza for safety. This is why those still operating in Gaza need even more support. eSIMs for Gaza is continuously allowing people to stay connected and online. They need more eSIMs. Please consider making them a regular donation. They help emergency services stay in touch with each other, families stay in touch with each other, and they help keep communications up in Gaza. Care for Gaza continues to provide aid from within Gaza, delivering food to families. And the Palestine Children's Relief Fund is also still active in Gaza, delivering vegetables to alleviate hunger for Ramadan. Ceasefire talks have begun in Cairo. We hope to see a decisive end to the violence, primarily enacted by Israel upon civilian populations, but until then, we can't stop fighting for the innocent people who need it most. I started doing this because I wanted to keep a record of Israeli war crimes and amplify aid for people in Gaza. Even if the podcast itself is a work of fiction, I hope it can make even a little difference in the lives of real people. And it's thanks to you, our listeners, that this is even possible. So thank you. We love you. Stay safe. Kalea'an para sa Palestina. Ingat. Hey everyone, it's Motsi. I'm doing the credits today, don't be alarmed. I am the creator of Hainai, and Hainai is a podcast produced by myself, Yoi Helago, Elisa Jimenez, and my co-creator, Reg Helly, and is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 4.0 International License. This episode was co-produced by Jesse Goodsell and written and directed by Motsi Dapu, who also plays the role of Mary Datuin. Well, that's me. The role of Donner is played by Leon Johnson, the role of Evelyn Y is played by Natalie, and the role of Richard Henry is played by Tom Pilcher. The role of... is played by... If you'd like to chat with other listeners when this episode goes live, we do a live premiere every other Sunday at 9pm EST or Toronto time on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash hainaipod. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel and catch when these lives go up. To help support the production of Hainai, you can subscribe to our Patreon, patreon.com slash hainaipod. You'll get to be part of our early access program where we release episodes three days earlier on Thursday at 9pm EST or Toronto time. You can also get bonus video, audio, art, and many, many more. And if you subscribe at a minimum of $10 for our at that tier, you'll even get some bonus episodes. Speaking of Patreon, we'd love to give a shout out to our following patrons for their amazing support. Jesse Goodsell, Danny, Diana Koz, Emma Heilig, Evie Smith, Jaden, Madeline Hicks, Malaya Light, Megan, Melissa, Pablo Neurotic, and Victoria Goodwin. If you can't subscribe monthly, you also have the option to buy us a milk tea on coffee. That's ko-fi.com slash h-i-n-a-y-p-o-d. Our ad-free Heine album, which has our official music and full episodes from Act 1 and 2, is also available in both Patreon and the coffee store. Check out our website, hainaipod.com, for more information. And for more news and updates, don't forget to follow us on our blog, hainaipod.tumblr.com, as well as our socials on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, at hainaipod, that's h-i-n-a-y-p-o-d. Hainai is available on Acast and wherever you listen to podcasts, such as Spotify, Apple Podcasts, etc. 
We hope you enjoy our Act 3 episodes. And as always, thank you, we love you, and hanggang sa muli.